What is going on guys, it's Modded Warfare here, welcome back to another PS4 tutorial. So in this tutorial we have RetroArch finally for uh, the PS4, I've been waiting for this for quite some time. So far all we've had are kind of PS2 versions of RetroArch that have been made to run on the PS4 through the PS4's built-in uh, PS2 emulation. Which obviously isn't great because it's like having an emulator inside of another emulator. So it doesn't run perfectly and it's a very old version of RetroArch. Whereas this version that we're going to install today is, you know, based on I think one of the latest versions of RetroArch. It's not an official release of RetroArch, but it is a native version of RetroArch for the PS4. It does not use the PS2 emulation in the PS4. So we finally have a native version of RetroArch for the PlayStation 4. Um, and yeah, it looks pretty awesome. So let's get into how to set this up and install it. If you're not familiar, RetroArch is a multi-system emulator. So it allows you to run games from multiple different systems from days gone by, stuff like um, SNES games, NES games, DOS games, MAME games, Atari games, PS1, Nintendo 64 is a bit, it's pretty much unplayable at the moment, but hopefully there'll be a fix for that sometime in the near future. But yeah, you can run games from all these different systems from like the 1980s to the early 2000s on this one emulator. So it's pretty awesome. And I've covered this on the PS3. I've covered it on the Nintendo Switch. Now we finally have it for the PS4 as well. And there's a few different ways to install it. I'll put the download link in the description to the RetroArch um, PS4. Uh, currently, this is revision one. Hopefully, there'll be future revisions. So keep checking the post. I'll put the link to the, the forum post I got this from, which should be updated with the latest versions as they come out. So just install the latest version from when you're watching this video. So a few different ways to install it here. If we head over to the PS4, then of course what we're gonna want to do, you need to be on 5.05 uh, firmware for this, I believe. It may also work on like other exploited firmwares, but generally it's recommended that you're on 5.05. So we're going to go into the internet browser and we're going to go ahead and go to our exploit page, head over to 5.05 and run the homebrew enabler, you know, 1.8 or higher. Okay, there we go. So once hen is running, you can install this in a couple of different ways. If you have the homebrew store, then apparently it's been added into the homebrew store. So you can just open the homebrew store and download RetroArch from there. Um, or, of course, if you've got the remote package installer, you can use that. So you run the remote package installer. And then here on your computer, you just use a package sender uh, app where you put in the IP address of the PS4. I think my IP has changed now, actually. It's now uh, 166. So you put in the IP address of the PS4 and the IP address of your computer. You just add in the package file and then you just click... Uh, send all or send and it adds it to downloads right there and if we head back onto the ps4 you can see there it's now installing and it is now finished and there we go it's now installed so there's two different ways you can install it there over the network or the other option of course if i just go ahead and delete this so the other option is to copy it to a usb drive so if you head over to your computer plug in a usb stick Make sure the USB stick is formatted in XFAT or FAT32 format. If it's not, you can right click and format it and select XFAT or FAT32 as the file system. Click start and it will start formatting it in that format. And then you can go ahead and copy the package file to the root of the USB drive. Don't put it inside any folders and then you should be good to install it on the PS4. Now at this point, you might also want to install any ROMs that you have, any games that you want to run on RetroArch. So I've got a folder here called ROMs and I just put all the uh, games that I was going to test in here. So I've got, you know, uh, Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, an N64 game. I've got some PS1 games, um, Sonic the Hedgehog, which is a Genesis game. So yeah, I've got all of those games in this ROMs folder and I'm just going to copy that also onto the root of the USB stick here. So if you don't have a USB stick or you're not wanting to run the ROMs from a USB drive or you just don't have a USB drive, then you can install the ROMs, your games, to the internal hard drive of the PS4. Now you can either do that with a USB stick and you know just copy them from the USB stick to the internal hard drive using a homebrew app like PS4 Explorer, 
or you can use FTP if you don't have a USB drive to install them, uh, which does it over your network. So to do that real quick, if you head over to your internet browser and we go back to the exploit page, and this time we go to 5.05 .05 and select FTP, that'll load up the FTP payload. So you'll get a little notification there in the top left, and then you should get another one with the IP address and port. So keep that in mind. And then open up an FTP client on your computer like FileZilla or WinSCP. So I've got FileZilla here. In the host box, you type in the IP address of your PS4, which came up in that notification. Port number was 1337. Quick connect. And now you're connected to your hard drive over the network. Then you can just go to data and then copy your ROMs folder into the data folder. And then that will copy them all there. And that is the default location that RetroArch looks for your games on the hard drive. It'll look for them inside that data folder. So your ROMs should show up right there. And there we go, that's copied over. Way before it could copy over to my slow USB stick. So again, you don't have to copy your ROMs to both the USB and the hard drive. It's up to you if you want to load them from the hard drive, copy them over to the hard drive using FTP, or if you want to load them off a USB or external hard drive, then just copy them to the external hard drive or USB stick. Okay, so I'll plug this USB into my PS4 now. Okay, so on the PS4 here, if you're installing the app from the USB drive, then you're going to have to go into the settings. And since you've ran the homebrew enabler, payload you'll have the debug settings at the bottom you go in there go to game go to package installer and install retroarch from there and that will just install it off the usb drive it's much quicker installing it using you know the homebrew store or the uh, remote package installer but i know that some people seem to have a problem with connecting online should probably do a video about dispelling rumors but for some reason people are still too scared to connect to the internet on their 5.05 .05 ps4 i mean it's on an older firmware you're not going to get banned just chill um but people still for whatever reason are like adamant on staying offline on the ps4 and they're just making it more difficult for themselves but hey you do you okay so now we've got retroarch on here now i've got the usb stick in so i'm going to run the game or the app and there we go it starts loading up there and there we are we have native retroarch on our ps4 now yes it looks very bare bones right now because it doesn't have any of the content and again this is why you should make sure your ps4 is connected to the internet because we can easily use the online updater to get everything we want however if you're offline this is going to be exceedingly more difficult because you're going to have to download um, all the assets and stuff manually and copy them over to um, the retroarch folder in your hard drive in the data folder so there's a data folder and then there's a retroarch folder and you have to copy all of your assets and stuff in there um, whereas if you're connected to the internet on your ps4 then you can just go to the online updater here and um, go down to um, update assets press circle on that and as you can see it starts downloading the zip file from the internet and we'll just skip this with the power of uh, video editing till we're nearly done and then you'll see everything miraculously change well, as soon as it's installed or extracted everything from the zip file. And there we go. As you can see, all the icons and everything's now updated. The font is a lot better. Um, so then we can do things like update core info files as well. Update joypad profiles, just everything. You know, you can update cheats if you want. I'm not going to use cheats right now. Update databases. And it's downloading all of these things to the data folder. So I've, again, data forward slash retroarch or retroarch um, is the folder that all of these things are being downloaded and extracted to. We can update our overlays and of course GLSL shaders. We can't forget about that. Okay, so once we've downloaded everything from all the updaters, you might want to just restart retroarch. Um, I should also mention that it's not X to select. It's kind of reverse. It's circle to select and X to go back in the menu. Um, so that might throw some people off at first, but uh, that is how you use the menu. So there we go. So we should have everything updated and ready to go now. So we can go ahead and load core and then select one of the cores. Um, so let's do um, Sony PlayStation first of all here. So you press circle and that will load the core. And then from there, you can then go to load content to load the game. And of course, it's got the two directories here. So the USB 0 
and then there's my ROMs on the USB drive. So you can load the games from the USB or you can load the games from the data folder on the hard drive. There it is right there. And this is quite interesting because this game is a multi-disc game. So Alone in the Dark, it's got, I think four discs or maybe it's just two discs, but two different tracks per disc. So yeah, there's four separate bin files for this game. And on most emulators I've used, you know, ones for the PS4, even the Switch in some cases, it will not load these, but this will. So you just select the core and it should load it. So, okay, no PlayStation BIOS found. You can add BIOS files for better compatibility. But as you can see, the game is running. This is something that didn't work in um, Medafin emulator, which is the other emulator that could run PS1 games. At least the initial version of that emulator was not able to run these multi-disc games um, or multi-track games, whereas uh, this emulator can handle them and it runs them. I'm not sure if Modafin, because it has had a few updates uh, recently, so maybe it can load multi-disc games now. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I haven't gone back and really used it uh, on the new updates, but... But yeah, it's great that this has the ability to do that straight off the bat. And as you can see, it runs absolutely fine. Plus, uh, again, a lot of these other emulators, if you want to end the game and load up another game, you have to actually close the whole application and then relaunch it. Whereas with RetroArch, of course, you can press start and select at the same time. And that'll bring up the menu. And then you can just go to close content and that will bring you back to the main menu of RetroArch. Apparently, there is a bug right now that can mean that when you close a game and then you try and launch another game it can just um, like black screen or not load the other game in which case you will have to close and restart the the app but again that's stuff that I'm sure will be fixed in future so yeah if we load content or load core uh, let's go and load the Sega Genesis so we'll load that core and of course you can customize things as well I can change like the input um, so for example, if I want to change the menu toggle, right now it's start and select, which is, you know, on a PS4 controller, that's the options button and the um, touch bar button at the same time. But yeah, I kind of prefer the way it was on PS3, which was L3 and R3 at the same time. So I'm going to select that so I can change it. You can customize all of that. If you want an FPS counter, you can go down to on screen display and add a frame rate counter and get all that stuff working. And then we'll load content, data, ROMs. This time we'll run Sonic the Hedgehog. Good old classic. And there it is. Running at 60 FPS as it should. I'd be pretty concerned if it was, if it was running <laughs> below 60. I mean, 59.9 something, I mean, you know. Let's give it a break. It's it's 60 FPS essentially. Running real smooth. All right, so oh, that's just pause. Let's go ahead and close content again. So I'll attempt here to load a Nintendo 64 game just to show you what happens, because this is currently um, not working very well. It's unplayable, but again, I'm sure there'll be an update at some point to get this working. I certainly hope so. So if we go ahead and run Zelda Ocarina of Time here. As you can see, it looks like everything's running fine initially. But once we get into the game, you can see the frame rate tanks. And th that frame rate can't be accurate because there's no way it's running at only 36 frames per second. It's running less than that. I would say more like 10 frames per second or 5 frames per second at that rate. So it's running super, super slow. Um, of course, you can adjust the settings, but I don't think it's going to make... A huge amount of difference here like for example you can go to uh, the options menu and then you can change some of these settings so for example you can change the GFX accu accuracy down to low and uh, you can change the GFX plugin to I think rice is supposed to be the the fastest one but it yeah it, yeah I mean it makes no difference now it's saying 60 FPS but that's clearly <laughs> not accurate so yeah there's still some problems but i mean this is just the first version and for the first version it's very very impressive that it's able to run all these games i mean 
But yeah, I'm sure they'll have this sorted at some point in a future version to get Nintendo 64 games working. But, but yeah, very, very impressive anyway that we now have a native version of RetroArch running on the PS4. So yeah, hope you guys enjoyed the video or found the information useful. If you did, please leave a like and subscribe and I'll hopefully see you guys in the next video.